Hi, my name is John Atkinson. I'm the editor-in-chief of Sterophile magazine, and I'm sitting here in my listening room with Jack Ockley Brown, head of acoustics at KEF, and Jack is setting up the KEF Reference 5 loudspeakers for me to do a review later in the year. So Jack, before we get into the in and outs of the Reference 5, when did you come to KEF? Oh, well, I, my first contact with KEF was actually in 2002. Mm -hmm. And I was a student studying acoustics. Yeah. And I, I started my acoustic engineering course at Southampton because I wanted oh. to design loudspeakers. Right. Um, yeah, Southampton is, is one of the hotbeds, I believe. Yeah, there's acoustic a, engineering. a rivalry in the UK between Southampton and Salford. Yeah. But they're the two specialist locations you can study. Um, and I was, you know, in among people doing acoustics for a variety of reasons. Most of them, you know, end up doing consulting work and things like that. Um, but I wanted to design our speakers since I was about 14. Um, and when it came to the summer holidays and I needed to get a job to earn some money, I thought, well, I don't really want to you know, do a work experience at a consultancy, holding a microphone in a field or something like that. Right. So I wrote a letter to every loudspeaker company I could think of. And I got one reply from Kef. <laughs> <laughs> so I worked in 2002 for three months and then... They, they must have thought it was okay because they said, do you want to come back next year in the summer holidays as well? Excellent. And then when I graduated, they offered me a job. And that was 2004. Oh, gosh. So. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Kef... I mean, I rem I'm old enough to remember when Kef started by Raymond Cook in the end of the 60s and knew all the people there, Laurie Fincham and so on. Yes. And I was so jealous when they set up their big, an their big cube to do quasi-anechoic measurements because it always struck me as an I irony that... The best room for doing quasi anechoic measurements is also a room as big that you would do you do anechoic measurements. No, that's true. So is that still there? We still chamber? we still have that room. Yeah, and we do still use it in you know the same principle that you window out the reflections. Right, but you want that yeah. reflection to be as far away as you can. Yeah, we get fifteen milliseconds. Fifteen milliseconds. So that's, that's no wonder I'm jealous. I, <laughs> I I get four in my my measurement. Yeah. Well, fifteen gets you sixty hertz frequency resolution. Yeah. So, I mean, that's pretty good, but it's still actually, we, we do outdoor measurements a lot as well yeah. to get very fine detail at low frequencies. Yeah. Do you use ground plane measurements? Yeah, ground yeah. plane. That's where you put the speaker on the ground, and the idea is that the reflection from the ground is actually in the same yeah. place. So. Well, we, we have a slight hybrid on the method, though, where we put the microphone on the ground. Yeah. So it's a way that you can eliminate the floor reflection completely. Right. So, I mean... It's the only caveat to that method is the British weather. Well, so yes. <laughs> that's a big caveat in Maidstone. So. Yeah, and environmental noise is always a problem. Yes. Yeah. Well, we've been very lucky over the years because where we're located down by the river in Maidstone, it, it's a commercial area that, that most of the companies have moved out of. But we've just seen development in the last five years of a lot of apartments oh. so I think you know maybe you know we're going to start to get complaints of people saying what's this funny sweeping noise you know yes. I well, can hear. well here I, I, <laughs> I started off doing all my measurements outdoors but even though we're in, in, a, in a suburb of New York it's quite noisy car noise noise from the um, the shore which is yeah. just half a mile away and we're on the glide path from LaGua for the LaGuardia <laughs> airport so you know so I end up doing measurements indoors, yes, except yeah. that I can have to have limited resolution, which is why I'm again jealous of <laughs> Kef's big chamber. <laughs> so, Jack, what was the first speaker you worked on for Kef? Um, when I first joined in 2004, the Muon project, which was the, you know, the big loudspeaker that we designed with right. Ross Lovegrove as the, the des industrial designer, that was gathering pace. We had... It was a concept at that point called Austin, which you may remember or not. That was the code name for no. it. But they they were working on the new version of the UniQ, and there were some things that needed finishing on the mid-range. So I, my first job, I think, was to do some computer modeling of the mid-range uh, yeah. of that and redesign the surround, I seem to remember. And then my first, I guess, loudspeaker proper was the one of the KHT pro uh, projects, which was these... Um, home cinema in a box uh, speakers. Okay. So the eggs, there's been several versions of those, but the, the KHT3005, the driver and the system for that, yeah. that was probably my first kind of full full project. Right. At Sterophile, we 
ignore home theater. <laughs> we, li we leave that to our sister magazine, Sound and Vision. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, so, it's... Uh, it was. It's still quite a big part of the business for us. Oh, of course. But, and you know, we, the UniQ technology has been driven actually by f quite a few different projects, including some of the home theatre ones. So, yeah. the the little UniQ we did for that, um, it had a lot of the kind of new things that would actually develop for even the high end speakers mm -hmm. put into that. Yeah, I mean, I remember when the UniQ was introduced, which was what eighty nine. Yes. Yes, and I remember going to a. A press reception in Chicago when the CES was held in Chicago and thinking well that is really a neat concept but then I found that with with coaxial drivers whereas in the UniQ you have a tweeter mounted within the mid-range dome you could get quite a lot of problems in terms of yeah. cancellation yeah. as the sound from the tweeter dome reflects off the edges of the yeah, mid-range dome. Now, you worked on the Tangerine Waveguide, right? To yes, over overcome right. that problem. Well, I think that that's one of a few things that overcome those issues. So, I mean, I always say to people when, when we invite them into Maidstone to have a tour, we've got a museum. And so you right. can see the UniQ that was in the C35, the first one. And you can see next to it some of the, kef the contemporary products in right. the period. And you can see it's a bass driver based on something they already had. Yeah. With a miniaturized tweeter in it. And, you know, what does that give you? Well, it gives you a single point of sound. And it gives you, it eliminates interference between the drivers. Mm -hmm. But it also comes with a whole way of having to design the drivers so that they work well in that configuration. Right. Right. And I think, you know, a lot of the work that I've done since I've been at KEF, is to try and actually get over the potential problems. And I'd, I'd say, summarize it really as three three different things. Mm -hmm. So firstly, the, the shape of the tweeter dome that you need when you've put it in a UniQ is different from the shape of the tweeter dome it's you need on a It's not just a spherical bathroom. dome. It is a spherical dome, but it can't be anything else. And a lot of tweeters that you design to put on a baffle will be a different shape. Oh, uh -huh. So, for example, Celestian, who our sister company, came up with elliptical profile domes, and we used them for a while at KEF. But they don't work well when you put them into a UniQ. And you need to get the spherical shape of the dome exactly right compared to the walls of the UniQ as well. And that was something that my colleague Mark Dodd really came up with for the Muon project. Mm -hmm. And that's stage one. That's just to get the, the sound from the tweeter started travelling down the waveguide. Right. And then you come to the next issue, which is you arrive at the edge of the cone where you'd normally have a big half roll surround. And it'll scatter off that. And you know the next thing to really fix was that problem. And we now use very low profile surrounds. Like yeah. you've I'm sure you've seen the one on the LS50, for yes, example. Yes, yes. Do you have one rare, I think? Um, I, this is actually a driver from a reference series, but it's the same yeah. the same thing. So the surround that you, you see very on the edge shallow. here is, is a continuation of the cone. Right. So that we're not disturbing the sound wave that's travelling down this surface at all. Right. And, and the, the tangerine, what does that do? The tangerine is actually, uh, technically it's a type of compression driver. So a compression driver is very familiar to people in uh, in audio right. from pro audio yes from, right and celestian are uh, so part of the same group as kef i do a lot of work with them on compression drivers so what you do with a compression driver is you you cover up the diaphragm the dome and then you can choose exactly which areas of the dome you want to radiate sound so right you normally do that in pro audio to make it more efficient right but in this case we're doing it to solve a particular problem which is in acoustics, you really like pulsating sources. So that's sources which are moving radially. Right. So the surface just gets bigger and smaller, like as if you're blowing up and letting air out of a balloon. Got it, yeah. And a dome is the right shape, but it's moving axially. Right. Because you're driving it with a voice coil. So we said, well, you know, is there a way that we can make it behave more like this ideal of a pulsating source? And by covering up the dome and then choosing exactly where you allow the sound to radiate, you can get it to behave more like a pulsating source. Got it. You do get a bit of uh, a compression driver effect anyway, so we get a bit more efficiency as well from that configuration. So that was something I, I worked uh, quite a lot on because the details of exactly how you need to do it are quite complicated. And also when you come to actually manufacture the thing, the constraints of, of what you can do with the mouldings mm -hmm. uh, have, to, have to be considered as well. Yeah.
So it's a kind of interesting crossover between the two uh, different worlds uh, in loudspeakers, the pro side and the consumer yeah, side. Yeah, I'd never, th I'd never thought of that as being a compression driver before. I thought it was just a, a conventional tweeter dome with a rather ornate. Yeah. I mean, it's very gentle. Grill in front of it. I mean, it's the other way you could describe it is almost like a lens, yeah. you know, if you like. So it's com a conversion between something which is moving axially and to something, to which, is something which is closer to being radio. Yes, exactly. So, yeah. uh, but I, you know, I think you know, when you kind of look back now and you see the early Uniqs, you can, you can, and we we do get sometimes a chance to hear them. We get people bringing in speakers mm -hmm. which are are quite old. You know, the speakers last for ages if you keep keep care of them. And yeah. we're lucky enough that you know we have uh, customers who really like the sound of the old models and they'll want them repaired, mm -hmm. and we can have a listen to them. And you do hear all of the characteristics of a UniQ, even in the early days. Yes. Like this yeah. wide sound stage and the imaging and this kind of natural uh, sound through the upper mid. But mm -hmm. you can hear some of the problems quite easily in yeah. retrospect, I think. Yes, and you say this is the third generation of UniQ. Trials. No, well, the generations is, oh. is you know, quite numerous. So I think we, it depends how you count them, but we I think we say about 11th generation grief. now. But those are the, I'd say those are the three key aspects which make you know, the UniQ really work properly now. Yeah. There, there are two KEF loudspeakers that I've reviewed using UniQ coaxial drive units. The first was the LS50 Anniversary Edition, which used a single driver in a relatively small cabinet, which I gave a very positive review to. They work so well in my room. And then I then reviewed the Kef Blade 2, which combined a different UniQ mid-range tweeter with four woofers in a very unusually styled cabinet. The um, Reference 5 uses, like the Blade 2, uses four woofers, except they're on the front of a cabinet. The Blade had them in pairs on the two sides, and a different UniQ tweeter mid-range again. So, what are the differences between the Reference 5 and the Blade 2, considering they, from superficially, they yeah, okay. appear to use yeah. similar drive units? So the, it's maybe worth just looking at the reason that the Blade is, is shaped like uh -huh, as uh -huh. a starting point. So the, the focus of the UniQ is to deliver sound as if there's a single source. Right. So that means that the sound has to originate from one point in space, but it also has to be match directivity. So, you know, for example, at the crossover, you need the tweeter directivity to match up with the mid-range. Right. And, you know, since the early days of UniQ, that's what we've been trying to do. Um, we can go into the reasons why we're trying to do that a bit later, maybe. Um, Blade, the whole idea was then to say, well, why, why are we restricting ourselves just to the mid and treble? What would happen if we tried to do the bass as well? And how would that look? Right. And again, my colleague Mark really was the guy who originated the idea of saying, well, let's just put the UniQ on the front and then we can put the bass drivers much closer to the UniQ than you would be able to otherwise. Uh, and they fall into these opposing pairs on the sides of the loudspeaker cabinet. Yeah. Um, and there's a really big advantage of that, which is the force cancel. Thing. Right. So it's the two cones are going like that, yeah. and they're, they're coupled inside, mm. any reactive motion is going to be cancelled. Yeah, and then the next benefit is you've then only got the single UniQ on the front. So the, f the front of the cabinet can be shaped whatever you like, and so we can choose that to be a very smooth surface to right. minimise diffraction. Right, so the sound comes out of the mid-range unit, but then doesn't meet any boundaries exactly. as it propagates. Yeah. So the, the whole thrust of that speaker you know, is really to get, take this idea of let's try and create this single pure, so mm -hmm. pure sonic source to a kind of uh, as far as we possibly can. Um, and you know, that's what it does, and it sounds as it does because of you know, these acoustic characteristics. Right. With the reference, we're very aware that these speakers are things that people have to put in their houses and they have to, to live with and see every day. Yeah. And the blade looks, in my mind, spectacular, but in other people's minds, dreadful, actually. Well, it really, it's well, it, maybe idiosyncratic is a yes, better word. It splits opinion, I think. So when we came to do the reference series, which has been a kind of classic KEF range for actually longer than the UniQ, mm. uh, we decided it, it would be sensible to do the opposite in yeah. terms of the styling. Uh, and that, in a way, handed the engineering team 
quite a big challenge to say, well, how do we get as much of the blade performance, but now do it in a conventional loudspeaker right. and put the drivers on the front? Um, so they look very different intentionally. Yes. But what we're trying to do with them is really the same thing. So the thrust of the blade, when you break it down, is that we've got this point source-like characteristic and we have low coloration. I mean, th those are really, you know, the things yeah. that you could well, summarize well, Kef as being has always essential. been about low coloration since the original R105. Yes. And Although there, that speaker had some issues with <laughs> dynamics, but nevertheless, it was extremely neutral. Yeah. So the... The way that we can do that on the Reference 5 with the point source like characteristics are limited, but we do uh, do that by having a symmetrical driver array. Yeah. So you probably, have, I'm sure you've heard of the Dapolito configuration yes, yes. with Twitter. So it's exactly the same thing, except now you don't have a Twitter, you've got a UniQ instead. Right. And that means that crossover frequency for the Dapolito array is much lower. And actually, if you look back at Dapolito's original works, he wanted it to be lower to get yeah. symmetrical. Uh, uh, symmetrical dispersion, but actually, if you go low enough, you get lobe-free vertical dispersion. Too. Or rather, the lobes are yeah, are, are yeah, just completely yeah. out of the way. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we're we're low enough that they're gone because yes. it's crossing over to the base drivers at about three hundred and fifty hertz. Okay, so you know, it's not as point source like as side firing, but it is its point source characteristics are still there. Yeah, the low diffraction is obviously a big challenge. One of the key things that you don't immediately notice is the shadowing around the UniQ. Oh, so oh right, this that, that's is, this actually got a profile. Is, is, is profile. Um, because the diffraction really depends on how much you illuminate any hard edges. Yeah. So the waveguide of the, of the UniQ naturally narrows the directivity as you go higher in frequency. And if we guide it a little bit more with this flare, we can minimize how much sound arrives at these edges. Mm -hmm. So. For something which looks like a hard edge box, you get much much less diffraction than you would see if the tweeter was just on the baffle. Yeah, that's a, a subtle aspect. It I hadn't noticed subtle. that, but yes, it, it's it continues the profile. Yeah. And then, in terms of the low coloration, the force cancelling is a huge advantage because you know, big uh, one big aspect of coloration is cabinet uh, mm. resonance and sound radiated from the walls of the cabinet. So. We had to overcome that in a different way, but we kind of already had technology to do that from LS50. Yeah. So with a loudspeaker where you don't have force cancelling, the majority of the sound radiated by the cabinet is vibration transfer from the drivers. And uh, with the LS50, uh, again, Mark Dodd, my colleague, he, he realised that you can add all the bracing you want, you're never going to move the panel resonances out of the audio band. Mm. So he said, well, let's do it a different way. Let's shift our focus on to adding damping and he came up with a, a system where you have bracing but you don't couple it rigidly to the panels of the box you use layers of damping material between the bracing and the cabinet mm -hmm. so as soon as any there's any movement in the cabinet wall this damping material will get compressed and that way it uh, dissipates the vibrational energy yeah but the tuning of that system must be critical because if you have say you have a strong high q resonance mm. and you add damping you're turning into a low Q resonance, which means it will be excited more of the time. It's a broader band. But yeah. Again, if you look at the full analysis, which I, there is a AES paper on the LS50, you only really see significant radiation from the cabinet walls at the resonant frequencies. Mm. And as soon as you add damping, you attack you know, the biggest part of the problem straight away, right? Um, which is the peak. So you bring the peak down significant yeah. by doing that. And in a, in a cabinet as large as the Reference 5, mm. that must have been a very complex operation. Did, did you model it mathematically? We did some uh, computer simulations and numerical simulations mm -hmm. uh, to figure out exactly what spacing we needed for the different braces. Yeah. Um, the construction inside is quite complex and the cabinets are very heavy. Um, we've got some cutaway views which I think we can probably uh, put yeah. up to, to, show, to show this. Um, the other thing is there's a spine of bracing that runs right down the middle of the cabinet, so directly behind the drivers. Mm -hmm. And the drivers, the back of the driver magnet touches onto this bracing like a, a, a spine, if you like. Um, and that's because one of the things we found is that the weakest part of the cabinet is where it's connected to the driver. Mm -hmm. So if you think about the baffle panel, the vibration force is going perpendicular. 
and the panel doesn't have much stiffness no. perpendicular to its surface. So we try and transfer this vibration into the bracing you know, directly off the back. Yeah. That's a, now that's for woofer from the reference file. Yes, that's right. And if, if looking at it there, the voice coil you can just see is not connected direct is not the connect, connected directly to the diaphragm. Instead, there's a series of radial ribs. Yeah. So so, then what why, what is the reason for that? Why not connect the voice coil directly? So I mean the the reason is really down to trying to get the motor. Uh, very linear and high power. Right. So that dictates that we need a very big voice coil. And that then leaves you with a potential acoustic problem, which is you've got a lot of air that is inside the voice coil. Right. That in a conventional design needs to vent somehow. Well, um, I see on, on the base you do have a vent yeah. in the center of the magnet, but yeah. that's not sufficient. No, that is, um, if you work out the areas, because of course area is the radius squared, that's not anything like the same as the area of. Right, of the voice diaphragm. Yeah. So we work quite hard on a way of trying to get this air out much more efficiently without causing turbulence or noise and came up with this which we call a vented coupler. So it's got much much more area there for the air to flow out and if you run this in free air it's almost silent, you mm. don't hear air pumping through. Um, vibrationally it then also gives you a way of optimizing the design to minimize breakup. Right, well I see, yeah, so you can choose exactly where these supports are connected to the diaphragm and yep. then arrange for that to control the behavior of the diaphragm. Yes, exactly. And it's all done, you know, we, we've always believed in engineering things by trying to predict what's going to happen first at KEF. And yeah. you know, these kind of designs really come out of our numerical simulation tools. Uh, so all of this was carefully designed on the computer and then you know we can make a prototype that should be very, very well optimized before you know, having to do various iterations. So, right. Um, the level of performance you can get by that approach is, you know, way beyond what you could achieve if you're doing it, you know, by trial and error in a lab. Yes. Um, and in in a way, it's a great tool as an engineer because it gives you so much freedom uh, to try out stuff without having to either go and ask for a budget for it, yeah. <laughs> or necessarily tell anyone you're doing it. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I think there's always that, you know, thought of the axe hanging over you. So well, I want well, to spend yeah. all this money developing this I great idea I've got, and you think, oh no, is it going to work? So yeah. So by the time <laughs> you get, you, by the time you get to the prototype, you you sort of know how it's going to behave. Yeah. And the rest it. is fine that's tuning. It. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Now the UniQ unit in the reference five is different from the one in the Blade Two. I understand. That's right. That's right. So the Blade, um, the Blade and Blade Two use the same UniQ. Uh, we, when we developed the concept blade, which was the the prototype product, uh, well, it wasn't a product, the prototype loudspeaker that uh, we used to develop the technology. One of the things we were really trying to do was move to rigid diaphragm right. operation. Kef, you know, so actually since the start of the company, we're a plastic diaphragm mm -hmm. company. You know, we our first cones were some expanded polystyrene, and then we've had well, the B one three nine with B one three nine polystyrene. Yeah. Well, cone it's not a cone it was this <laughs> kind of elliptical thing that's right and and we've had various different uh plastic film tweeters and things in our history as well and and that's what we always used to use but with a plastic uh you get breakup in the operating band yeah uh, the flip side is you can get plastics which you've got a lot of damping yeah so you can try and spread the resonance out and try and disguise it but we always felt that you could hear the, the characteristic of the material. Yeah, that kind of little quack. I mean, exactly. Although I wouldn't say the Beckstreet cone of the B11, a Kef B110 driver quacked, but it certainly had a certain character. Yeah, and I think, you know, we kind of had this almost kind of philo philosophical discussion between us. So, well, if, if there's no bending in the material, then you won't be able to hear what the material characteristic right. is it doesn't matter what you make it from so we really focused at, you know at the point of blade of doing that on all the transducers you know j at least well within the bandwidth and a bit more so you could cross them right. over right. so for for blade and blade 2 uh, we had a a cone that was very complicated construction so it's got a front skin which is uh, aluminium alloy like uh, the one you see here but mm. on the back it has a very large voice coil which is actually about halfway along the cone and a system of uh, ribs to connect the two together and stiffen the cone as well. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and the plastic we used for the ribs was uh, from a material called liquid crystal polymer as well. Very, very high stiffness. Right. And it must be also quite light, so you yes. don't want all that well, added mass. And it can be moulded in very, very thin walls is, is a key thing as well. So that structure is very good. And we get a cone that breaks up at about 9 kilohertz. Oh, so what's so two octaves above crossover. Exactly. Um, but because the voice coil is out here, the motor system that goes with that has to be huge. Um, it was you know, great and it worked really well, but when we came to then say, well, what are we going to do on our lower end products like LS50 and like Q-Series and R, mm -hmm. we, we couldn't use the same technology, so we had to come up with another solution. Right. And so what we did was say, well, if you take just a, a pressed aluminium cone like this one, it breaks up at about 5 kilohertz, and we're going to cross it over about 2.5 or 3, mm -hmm. so that's pretty good anyway. Uh, but when it does break up, boy does it break up, yeah. it's like 20 dB peak is yeah, quite it's... typical. So with a passive crossover especially, you, you can't disguise that, you'll, you'll hear that. Yes, I mean even with a third order crossover, that peak is still going to be at full level. Yes, yeah, and I think that's probably you know, one of the reasons why early days of metal cones, they split opinion again, because yeah. on one hand they had advantages, on the other hand they have this, this problem. Um, so our, our method of overcoming the problem was to add uh, a damping ring in, which uh, we might have to show a picture of because it's quite hard yeah. to see here. So the voice coil doesn't drive the al aluminium aluminum cone directly, but there's a, a damping coupler between the voice coil and the diaphragm. Yes, so uh, it's, it's decoupled. And the idea is that low frequencies, everything moves together. It's, at low frequencies, it's moving quite slowly, so the rubber ring is effectively incompressible. Yeah. But we can tune it so once you reach you know this kind of four or five kilohertz uh, frequency we can get it to be resilient and we can stop uh, the force from reaching the cone and the effect on the breakup is is huge so we can get rid of this 20 db peak almost completely yeah so at that stage once we develop that technology the advantages of going to a metal cone completely outweigh the disadvantages and uh, you know We've had the blade uh, technology as well, and we're keeping doing that. But for the rest of the ranges, yeah. we have a technology which is achieving a similar thing. Yeah, but at a much lower cost. Exactly. Making the products yeah. more affordable. Yes. Yeah. So that's what we're using in this case. Um, the tweeter itself is actually pretty similar to the, mm -hmm. the one on the blade. Right. Now, in the reference 5, I think you said that it has the same internal volume as the blade 2. But it, but woofers on the front, ports on the back, and but you ports you've arranged to give quite a, a range of tuning options, right? <laughs> yeah. So um, we kind of spoke about this before we started talking to each other on the camera. But it's quite tricky when you're designing a loudspeaker because you don't know the character of the listening room, right? And there is no one listening room. We're dealing with all sorts of different yes. rooms. I mean, in the United States, rooms tend to be very somewhat light in weight in construction, drywall and studs. In Europe it's bricks. Mostly, yeah. And also the size of the rooms varies immensely. Yes. So yeah. I I don't know how you do it. Designing <laughs> one model which will sound good in typical European rooms, typical United States rooms, typical Japanese rooms. Yeah. I think historically, you know, probably the answer is maybe not as successfully as we'd like. Because yeah. what you tend to find is that if you take a range there's particular models that different countries love. Yeah. Uh, and it's, you know, in my opinion, from the acoustics point of view, I think it's a lot to do with room matching. Yeah. And the typical problem you have is in, you know, with a, a kind of room that's a lightweight construction, you lose quite a lot of bass out because yeah. the walls flex. So yeah. you, you're not getting as much reinforcement. And you need a speaker which gives a, a flat bass response pretty much without reinforcement. But if you take that into a European room, it'll sound like there's way too much bass. Because yeah. I think mean, Kef has always gone for what's called a maximally flat yes. design, yeah. but in a very solidly constructed room, that with the typical room gain, that will be a little too much bass. Yes, and and our solution uh, to that in in the past, and you know, still in some models today, is to provide a, a foam damping uh, uh, box that you can put in the port, yeah. um, which I don't particularly like because you know, we spend a lot of time working on the ports to avoid turbulence. So carefully profiling a flare. Exactly, and then we, and then we put a block of foam <laughs> in or a block of foam with a hole in and yeah. undo all the good work. So we're kind of determined for reference to say, well, let's find a better way to do this. Right. And, and you know, the, 
in some situations the simplest answer is is the best one and our, our answer is just to allow the user to choose what the tuning is so i've i've got them just down here but you when you have when you get the loudspeaker you get a range of different well a long and a short tuning mm -hmm. so if you if you choose the short ports it gives you maximally flat um, which should suit a, a kind of american style lossy room more. yeah um, or you can go for a longer tuning, which is more of an overdamped alignment right. to suit a British style of room. And you know, in both cases, we we flare the port carefully to avoid turbulence. Right. And there's an you know you get an additional advantage, which is actually I've moved the tuning down now, so I'm getting more deep extension. Mm. I'm not just throwing away energy by making the port more lossy. Right, getting a slower roll off, slightly slower roll off, a little more extension. Yes. And it's been an interesting, interesting to see how people have, uh, you know, adapted to the idea that you might want to fine tune the, the physical loudspeaker. Yeah. I think it, it generally has gone down extremely well with people. The you know the idea that they can tailor it to their room a little bit. Um, but we've also seen that there's just a lot of personal preference involved yeah. as well. That some some people just love the sound of one particular configuration, right. irrespective of the room, really, which is fine as well. So. Yeah. Well, thank you, Joe. I'm looking forward to listening to the speakers in my room. Thank you, John. It's You're really welcome. great to talk to you.